I'm so excited to be talking to you because we live figuratively in the same neighborhood, which is this intersection of sports, business, technology, media, culture. And it feels like we are in a really fascinating, lucrative, important moment. Mm -hmm. Do you agree? Yeah, it's, it's all converging. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it's been a 30-year transom. <clears throat> when, when I was at Goldman Sachs and we were working with Paul Allen to roll up cable companies, everybody thought that Paul wanted to go into the distribution business. The reality was is Paul wanted to be in the content business. And he had a, a saying back then. He said, you know, content is king. And he was just ahead of his time. Yeah. I would say today, content is king. And by virtue of technology disintermediation uh, and a, an increasing premium on the live event and interactivity that those two things generate, which means that the fan is going to be much more active, not passive, right. you're seeing an unbelievable convergence here. Right. When we invested in the Spring Hill company with LeBron James and Maverick Carter, they taught me something. They, I thought it was a media company, and they disabused me of that notion. They said, actually, it's a culture company. Right. And that was the first time I had heard that. And that's, that culture company uh, concept is the you know, coming together of all those streams you talked about. And when you have those sorts of collisions and intersections, money is sure to follow. Um, you are unique, but not alone in, in terms of seeing this economic uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. On the economics front, I'm going to go to the very crass level and just talk about valuations that are out there. I mean, people in this room, if you're reading the Bloomberg, which I'm sure you are, or almost any other major publication, you're seeing the headlines around the Broncos, Chelsea, other assets that are going to come up. What do you make of those valuations when you see three, four, maybe getting close to $5 billion for a single sports franchise? Look, the valuation discussion is, is, is complicated. Yeah. Um, I, I, I always remark in sports that, you know, this, this is a multi-billion dollar industry uh, and there's no equity research for it. Right. The equity research is Forbes magazine or it's things like this, right? You know, and, and that's why, you know, I, I try to be somewhat participative in, with the media to get out to everybody what I'm seeing mm -hmm. because it's a distributed equity research type of a, an approach. You know, the valuations, there's, a, there's on, not a lot of rigor to it only because it's a little bit of LIFO. I mean, it's just you look at the last trade and you put a markup on it. Um, now, what's, what's alluring there and, and deceptive is that everybody has been, you know, used to this, this everything always going up right. phenomenon in sports. That's anti-Darwinian. That's not possible, right? Now, the slope of that curve may change, but you know, for the foreseeable future and certainly in the past, everything keeps going up. Uh, what's going to change? Now, if you, look at, if you pay attention to the details and you look at some of the competitive auctions for sports team transfers over the last several years, I would argue in some of those that they were fails. Hmm. Uh, they, you know, the, they, they came in meaningfully below what the price talk was around it. Now, either the price talk was wrong or the competitive dynamic wasn't there, but something, you know, for someone who participates in this very actively, I see somewhat of a, of a divergence that we should be paying attention to. Right. But the valuations, at the end of the day, on the glass half full side of it, I would say the valuations signal the fact that there is something very premium here. There is scarcity value, uh, and there's something very unique in everything that's going on in media that you talked about with the con convergence of those streams, where this is some of the best content that you can access. Right. And you, you, know, you can't TiVo it, right, in the old saying. And that's why you're seeing these valuations continuing to escalate. For the younger folks in the audience, TiVo <laughs> was this, uh, look at it, Google it. Um, so you brought up something yeah. interesting that I want to build on, which is this notion of the, of the content, the entertainment value, and all of that. Mm. You and I were talking backstage, and, and you made me think about something in a very different way. Talk to me about the XFL, because that to me is one of the most exciting things that you're working on, I think you would agree. Um, you've got some big name partners <laughs> involved with you, talk about household names. Help us understand how that fits into the, the current mindset and also the current opportunity. Look, the XFL, for me, you know, the investing, I've been doing this for 30 years, and the XFL and the stuff I do today in sports and media is really a continuum of 30 years of this of investing, right? And um, I think it's just harder for anybody to show up today from a standing start and start investing in these sectors. 
Um, the XFL is so unique. It, it's an opportunity to create a live event media company with the potential to be global, rooted in legitimate football. Most people look at the XFL and see, you know, it's a spring football league. Um, you know, Dwayne Johnson looks at it very differently. Dwayne Johnson, if you, if, the great thing about Dwayne is if you said to him, I mean, he's the biggest celebrity in the world, phenomenal human being, if you said to him, you know, what's your one regret? First of all, I would think Dwayne has, should have no regrets, right, right? Right, If you ask him what his one regret is, is not making the NFL. And he remembers back to when he didn't make the NFL and he went to the Canadian Football League and then, you know, he basically went into wrestling uh, because he didn't make it there. You know, that is a passion for him that he wants to now revisit mm -hmm. and make things available to fans and players particularly. So his whole ethos, what to me was, Look, you know, we should look at this a little differently. Obviously, we're not the NFL, but there is a need. We did the work, and there is absolutely a, a desire and a need for spring football, right? So there's no binary risk there. Then the question becomes, with a partnership with someone like Dwayne and Danny Garcia, you know, can we create a new version of the way people think about leagues and sports, where it's rooted in true live event entertainment? You, you put a very credible and an NFL-quality type product on the field, but you put the fan and you put the players at the center of all of that, and then you have a, a, an alliance, a partnership with the NFL like we've established, where there is actually a synergy, where some of the things that we're going to be doing experimentally can be things that the NFL adopts, and, and then you know, it helps the whole ecosystem. So I'm, I'm fascinated by this. I think it is as far as I'm probably ever going to go to something like this. Right. Um, but I'm very proud of the fact that you know, with everything going on in the world, and you talk about the convergence of sports, media, and culture, this is the first league in history owned by a diverse woman and an African-American. And right. we know in traditional professional sports, that's, not, that's easier said than done. Yeah. And so that's also something right out of the gates that, you know, in our own little way, we're kind of advancing the ball in so many important areas that, that reinforce that convergence. So let's, let's talk about that element and, and kind of stitch the two things we're talking about together, which is these valuations which are going to the moon, yeah. but, but presumably. And also, I think, a broad social desire for diversity and inclusion. If you're asked to write a check for a top-tier EPL, NFL, MLB, NBA franchise, you got to stroke a, you know, probably a billion-dollar check mm -hmm. in some ways. It's a pretty limited number of people who can do that. Structurally, what do you see happening, especially for folks who are in this room, um, some of whom may be billionaires and, you know, ready to write a check. Others of whom may not be. Um, people watching as well. How should they be thinking about investing in sports and in the broader ecosystem? Well, look, investing in sports is, you got, you got to ask yourself, well, what, what does that mean? And, and most people think investing in sports is buying teams. You know, I've made a career out of investing in anything but the team. I've made a career out of partnering with the rights holders who own teams and leagues and creating terminal value, multi-billion dollar businesses around those rights holdings. Um, in, over the last five years, where I've evolved in my investing career, is I said that, you know, maybe I'm ready now to become the rights holder myself and let's vertically integrate that activity. Yeah. Uh, and that's some of the things that we've been doing. Um, you know, sports team ownership is, is gonna need to evolve uh, if you want to see this continued escalation in these asset valuations, ownership rules are going to have to change. Uh, the type of capital coming in will, will need to evolve, all of which is positives. And there's no negative the way it is now. It's just that, you know, these all have become multi-billion dollar mini Disneys. And, you know, my career is you, you've had this massive escalation in asset valuations. And really none of the people or the infrastructure has really kept pace. Right. And so what I've done is I go in with capital and a company building mentality and I close that gap. And in the process of closing that gap, I create multi-billion dollar businesses. So, you know, the ownership rules will catch up to that and that'll attract my kind of capital. My kind of capital right now sometimes can invest in teams, sometimes it can't. In Europe, it can, there's no restrictions. Right. In the NFL, it can't. Uh, and then some of the attributes around number of owners, uh, there's limitations around that. The, the minimum ownership percentage that the control owner needs to have. You know, all these factors, you know, they, everybody's going to need to, in each of these leagues is going to need to look at that and figure out what's best for the league and the teams to ensure that the right kind of support is coming in financially to continue this progression. Right. So as I think about, you know, myself and other, other folks in this room, we are, many of us, consumers 
as well as investors. And one of the places where that rubber meets the road, as it were, is in the media world. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I am a cord cutter, um, probably later than others, um, maybe well ahead of others. But, you know, I think about how I consume sports. Yeah. I think about how much has changed in the rights landscape um, with Amazon getting Thursday Night Football, with all of that being realigned. How would you describe sort of the state of the media side of pro sports and, and how we should be thinking about it? Well, look, I mean, you know, we created the Yes Network uh, with the New York Yankees back in 2001. Uh, we sold it to Murdoch in 2013. We bought it back in 2019 with the New York Yankees and Amazon. Very different plays. When we started, it was a growth equity play. Uh, uh, we sold it for $4 billion, bought it back for less than that. The EBITDA had doubled by that point from when we had sold it, and we bought it more as a, a, a different type of a growth play mm -hmm. with the potential mm -hmm. for a whole re-underwriting for version 2.0 based on direct-to-consumer uh, and, and based on more interactivity with the fan, which we talked about. You know, the demise of the cable bundle has been greatly exaggerated. Hmm. Uh, when you look at just ESPN, you know, ratings are up 30%. Um, you know, they, they've, uh, uh, viewership is up 40%. When you look at the Yes Network, the Yes Network had 8 billion minutes of consumption last year. That is more than the next 20 top primetime shows in aggregate. Think about that. Wow. 70% of Yankee games are rated number one in prime time. Right? Now, if... So much every, for the death of baseball, huh? Well, it's, very, it's interesting. You know, I, we always said that, you know, and, and again, it's unique to the Yankees in this market. Sure. It's unique to the Red Sox in their market. Um, and that is some of the best must-carry content in those markets. Opening day is tomorrow, and you're going to see the two of them. That's going to have tremendous ratings. Uh, and so... You know, I, I think that what you're going to see is the cable bundle will stay intact. It's the one place from a value proposition to the consumer, cord cutting or not, it's the one place where you can get, you know, a grouping of sports content. The, the streamers will, will look to come into this space, and they are coming into this space. You mentioned Amazon and Thursday Night Football. But it's going to be hard for the streamers to put together that, yeah. that portfolio of sports content the way the cable bundle can do right. it. And so you'll see, you'll see a combination. You'll see, you know, the, the, the benefit of the, of the streamers is that they will attract a younger demographic to some of these sports. There will be an a la carte nature to it. But at the end of the day, nothing, nothing I don't see anything that is going to replace that cable bundle in terms of that portfolio of sports content for the consumer. Right. You know, one of the other interesting things that, that, that feels investable, and certainly you've been involved in, you mentioned Spring Hill. And, and for those who don't know, Spring Hill Company is the combination of several companies that were started by LeBron James and his business partner, Maverick Carter. As you mentioned, it is a culture company. They produce a lot of media. They do, you know, some uh, sponsored content. It's an amazing platform in many ways. LeBron, in many ways, one of one, except he does represent this investable athlete concept in some way. And you've talked before about the IP of an athlete, the intellectual property around an athlete. Help us understand how that's evolved and maybe where it's going and how you think of it as an investor. Yeah, look, I mean, you know, it's, there's a great fragmentation going on in sports and media and now culture, and individuals are becoming IP in and of themselves. Now, you know, a few years ago, we created a company in partnership with the collective players in the NFL Players Association, Major League Baseball Players Association called One Team Partners, that aggregated the collective licensing revenues uh, for the Madden football video game, the Sony baseball game. Uh, and that was before and leading right into name, image, and likeness, NFTs, blockchain. All of that is a, is a, is a fragmentation of monetization of individuals. Individuals are becoming more IP in and of themselves. Yeah. Uh, and that's a good thing. Um, you know, what, what, what everyone is scrambling to catch up on is how do you monetize right. that? There's no, there's no playbook for that. Um, but there's no doubt when you look at, we were talking about, you know, whether Tiger Woods plays in the Masters, uh, you know, what do you think is going to happen to ratings for the Masters if he ends up playing? Um, you know, that, that's a positive capital. You know, partnering with individuals and helping them monetize their IP is something that fascinates me. Yeah. Uh, you know, our partnership with Dwayne uh, and Danny on the XFL, 
is about building a league. It's also about giving them a, a platform to monetize some of their IP in a very different way. Uh, same with Maverick and LeBron. Yeah. I mean, I dare say that it's interesting to, again, sort of synthesize some things you're saying. You think, you talk about sort of the importance of representation at the very top level with Dwayne and Danny um, that comes and, and has a real social and cultural impact. Oh. By the same token, at least in theory, from an NIL perspective, when you have a Paige Beckers or another college athlete who's able to monetize her or his likeness, there are some minefields for sure, but some real economic opportunity from both an individual and maybe a, a collective effort. Do you agree? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I, there is a huge responsibility that the breakout individuals have to their ecosystem. And so, you know, a Tom Brady or a Tiger Woods or a Peyton Manning, you know, they, and they know it, they know they have a responsibility to you know, monetize their own IP in a responsible way, but also do it such that it, it inures to the benefit of the ecosystem. Right. That playoff's going to be very interesting. And how the rules evolve, you talked about college. I mean, you know, that's, that's a whole, that is a very tough area, yeah. right? Because, you know, it's that, but there's no doubt that, you know, forget about college, how about going down to high school? Right. Uh, and there's no doubt our kind of capital is not only looking at college, it's now starting to look at, you know, sports in high school. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, you know, there's, there's going to be a lot of cautionary things that you're going to want to put around that. Um, but it starts with the pros, and the pros need to set the template and, right. and, the, and the, the, the responsible way of doing it and then see if there's, you know, iterations of that that can go down to college and to high school. So as we think about this, this ecosystem, you know, there are all these sort of seemingly ancillary but, but certainly integrated elements that are in, whether it is technology, fan engagement, um, sports betting, uh, all sorts of media plays as well. What most excites you from an investable perspective, especially for an audience of, of investors who are saying, well, you want to, I want to dip my toe into the sports world more broadly. What's the, what's the play here, do you think? You know, I, I, I'd love to give you a soundbite answer. Um, in the old days, the old days, you know, I remember five years ago, everybody kept saying that you know, the next frontier was China. Right, and they always talk about China with the NBA. I, I've got a, I, I've got a very unsexy answer. It's the stuff that's here. Yeah, version 2.0 of the stuff that here is what excites me the most. Interesting. These, these were hobbies, and they're now multinational live event entertainment companies. Nobody has figured out how to monetize the live event. Mm. I've nibbled around the edges, but no one knows how to do it. It's very difficult, but you know, it is the best must-carry content in any area. The ratings speak for themselves. What's fascinating is because of technology disintermediation, the fan is becoming is taking on a different role that is going to drive version 2.0. The fan is going to be much more interactive, and the and and the owners of leagues and the owners of teams are going to have to re-underwrite the value proposition to the fan, and mm -hmm. it's going to need to take into account that interactivity. That touches the flywheel of gambling and data analytics and all the things that you, you, know, you mentioned. And that's what excites me. So at the end of the day, owning rights is the hub to the spokes wheel. And that's why, going back to your earlier question, that's why you're seeing this escalation in these valuations. We may not be able to analytically substantiate these valuations as the way I would like to, the way I've been trained, you know, with real research and everything else. But I will tell you, when you step back and you look at that and you bring a 30-year perspective to it, there's a reason why these valuations are escalating. Yeah. What's the, any caution, any cautionary tale yes. here? What's, yeah. what's the, what's your bit of like pump the brakes? The pump the brakes is, is what I said earlier, which is things don't always go up. Mm. And you know, the young, our young generation and a lot of the young people who work for me, they've, they've only experienced something that, as I said, is anti-Darwinian. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and now, you know, sports, I've, I've, I've been on the record saying, you know, sports a little bit is like the new Hollywood. And so capital is, is doing what capitalism does, right? It's finding its way into these areas. And I think they're, you know, if anything, I think everything needs to just calm down a little bit. Right. Uh, and um, that's, that's the caution, I would say. I, I, it's all legitimate. Everything we've talked about, there's real terminal value in the basis of it. But there's a tremendous amount of capital sloshing around. And, you know, it's very difficult for people to get exposure, people in this audience, to get exposure to sports. How, do you, how would you get exposure to sports? People are trying to figure out how to do that. And, you know, I'd say that it's, it's tricky because uh, 
you'd want your capital going to work where you have a seat at the table, where you have an ability to exercise governance, where you want to be able to be a fiduciary to, to drive when you might want to exit or not. Very difficult to do that in sports. Yeah. And it's a closed ecosystem. And so I think capital has to look at some of those attributes that we look at in the corporate world. All that stuff I just said, in the corporate world, that's a given. Yeah. In sports, people are paying control premium valuations for minority stakes with no ability to get out and no governance. Well, that, that, you might want to look at that and say, well, wait a minute, is that, how's that going to go? Right, right. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to leave it there. We'll continue this conversation uh, over cocktails. I'm going to thank you before I tell you what to do next. This was fun. Thank yeah. you for doing yeah. this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. All right.